Hey, this is Tyler Jones, and you're listening to The Element Podcast. I wish the best for you. What's happening, all my woods people? We are chilling in the mouse house here <laughs> in Alba, Texas, and the guy laughing across from me is your favorite co-host, Casey Smith. What's happening? Uh, that I was not prepared for the mouse house. That's pretty funny. You, he left you some little, uh, little everywhere nuggets. Yeah, over there. I'm taking a bath when I get Saying home. Good. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, so that we're in a we're in a room on, uh, that's like. Adjoined to my house It's not like Truly part of the house It's like an add-on Or something I, know, I live in a rent house now But uh, Apparently it's not The most mouth, mouse Proof place No So Definitely not There's a uh, Yeah And what's bad is like All my fly tying stuff's in here So he's gonna get on there And chew on all my Bird feathers and stuff Probably Gonna chew your vice down <sighs> Man That's a good He better not better Speaking not. of vices <laughs> And mices <laughs> Hey For real yeah, For real yeah. We uh We are pretty fresh off of a Lano River trip down in Texas. We did a little fishing trip. And by the way, happy Easter, everybody. I forgot to say that. Yep. Uh, which by the time this releases, we'll almost be into the next weekend. But we are talking with a guest today that is cool for me because I've been a fan of the media that he has put out for the last like 10 years. Um, we're talking with Sean Luchtel. Of Heartland Bow Hunter. We're talking to him about burning. The burning sensation <laughs> that a land manager has inside of him to burn his property. And uh, Sean's got some experience doing that. Uh, he's got some guys that work with with him uh, at Heartland Bow Hunter that, uh, that know their way around the woods pretty well and know the different plant species and that kind of thing. So you guys will get to hear about that. But back to our trip. The mice and the vice. <laughs> we tied some flies. Yeah, in this very room. In tied some flies room. and then headed out shortly thereafter. I mean, was it the next day? Was I think it? it was. Yeah, we headed out the yeah. next day to uh, the uh, central part of the grand state of Texas. So the goal of the trip was to go down there and catch some uh, Texas native species, specifically the Texas uh, state fish, which is the Guadalupe bass, and then also the Rio Grande cichlid, which um, I'll just go ahead and let you know, one made an appearance, one did not. You're going to watch the film and see which ones. Sure. But, man, if you haven't done the hill country thing, Go down there, forget about all the wine tours and all that jazz, and go to a river and get somewhere where there ain't nobody else, mm-hmm. because that's what's cool. Which, uh, speaking of getting somewhere where nobody else is, we kind of, we saw that play out. Yeah, You know, like, success-wise mm-hmm. for us. Um, like, the further we got from people and less people we saw, the better the fishing was. Yeah, and... Uh, it's pretty cool because, all right, so a little plug for our friends on X, um, down there in the hill country, there's like no cell phone service Yeah, and you can't do nothing. But before we went down there, saved some maps, offline maps, and we were able to find like those super secluded little, uh, what, what, what do you call them? Low water crossings. Yeah. Uh, and use that for stream access so what you can do in texas if you didn't know this this is one of the few like super awesome public land things we have in texas anywhere a highway right away or any sort of uh right away crosses over a navigable navigable waterway you can use that to access that waterway so on a lot of these hill country rivers you anywhere you cross it on a highway or road you can get out there and walk as far as you want to in the stream bed and that's what we did, and that's mm-hmm. how we fished. Yep, and found some really cool spots. Yeah, so we didn't have to have any kind of crazy cool access or pay our way into anything. We yeah. just gas money to get down there, mm-hmm. and uh, slept in the bed of the truck. Yeah, and uh, not the most comfortable night I've had, but uh, slept pretty decent. <clears throat> but yeah, it's it was really neat, man. We got to hop off in some riverbeds and uh, super clear water and really cool cool water you know it feels good this time of year uh especially considering we had a couple of warm days you know yeah 
Um, but yeah, we had a blast. We caught quite a few fish. It was a little slow because the I guess the river was kind of low and slow. Yeah, it was a little but... bit low, a little bit clear. And in the past, I've had better luck, like not like when the river's high, but when it starts falling, it starts clearing up and falling to where you have like pretty clear water, but pretty swift and higher water, and that's when it's the best. But this year. It was kind of more, I mean, it was a lot like what it is in the summer when I'm down there. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you just got to figure out how to catch them. And I think by the last day we were there, we'd figured it out. Like, well, okay, so there's a topwater pattern. You just got to watch the film and see what that's all about. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're pretty much like midday. You just found find like the deep, deep spots, and there was fish in there. Mm -hmm. And that one spot, we stood there and just warm out for a while. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It was fun, man. And, you know, the uh, like like I said, the more remote we got, the seemed like the better the fishing got. And um, there was a couple times when you're sitting there driving, and you're like, I'm not sure that I'm not on just a ranch road here. Yeah. Like, I'm not oh, sure. Oh, for sure. Like, I mean, across some cattle panels, and you're in open range country out right. there. You know, it's yeah. it's it gets kind of wild. It does. Kind of western. It, it's a little yeah, western. And you actually, <laughs> oh, man, like, one of the best parts of the whole trip, we weren't even on the Lano proper, is a feeder creek. And uh, the water crossing across it, and we're literally driving, and Tyler sees fish. It, it, it barely had any water in pretty it. Pretty killer. You're and, just going to have to watch. Yeah. It yeah. was a pretty good one, pretty good fish that uh, was in that creek, and several of them. And, yeah, that was that was cool, man. And the weather was great. Um, only had one, you know, snake encounter, uh, which somehow I can at least manage one everywhere we go, it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> but you know down there you're thinking rattlesnakes you know mm-hmm. and you're you're kind of <clears throat> it's it's dry and arid you know and uh hot down there and it's just that kind of southwestern feel and you're thinking rattlesnakes the whole time and man kind of keeping an eye out but not worry too much staying in the river mostly <clears throat> well i hear a little the the i guess the morning we did we made a quick trip out of it so the only morning we fished there I'm walking back up the bank, and I hear, and I'm like, what is that? It's kind of behind me at this point, you know? And uh, and so I turn around, knowing pretty much what it is, and there is a large cottonmouth with his mouth wide open, facing right up at me, and his tail twitching in the leaves and the straw right behind him, making a noise, just you know, kind of like a rattlesnake would do. Except for he doesn't have any rattles. And I had just walked past this thing. I'm talking within <laughs> probably two and a half feet. And he was laid out, though. And I guess when they're laid out like that, they can't really strike very far, you know. I mean, they mm-hmm. don't have a whole lot of body to yeah, but spring them out there. Yeah, but near got stepped on, so oh, I'm pretty sure he could have got it. For sure. I mean, I was very close to him. And then, uh, anyway, he's he was just very, very large. And I had walked right past him and... Uh, anyway, we got a little footage of him, but not much. He was just nasty and no point in doing it, you know, but, um, yeah, it's fun trip, fun trip. So let's go from the cool waters of the hill country to the burning fires of the Midwest and get Sean on the phone. What do you think? <laughs> let's holler at him. All right. All right. On the phone now we have Sean Lucktel of Heartland Bowhunter. What's good, brother? Not much, man. Just, uh, just working away here in the office for shows. Wish I was doing something outside today. I was supposed to be burning, but conditions are a little too windy, so I opted out of that, and I'm sitting here at the desk just uh, getting some work done. Well, bummer on that, man. Um, We are not burning property either, (laughs) so (laughs) there are things that we would definitely rather be doing right now, too, but... uh, um, so goes life, man. But uh, you know, I was I'm I'm glad that you were uh, decided to be a part of this podcast, man, and that you uh, wanted to come talk to us a little bit. Um, I just want you to give us a, a rundown of um, how you came to be where you're at today. You know, um, maybe from like college all the way through uh, today. Kind of give us your story, give us a background, and let us know how you got where you're at. Sure. Yeah. Thank you guys for uh, for having me on here. By the way, I sure. really appreciate that. Always look forward to doing stuff like this. It's always fun to sit and talk about what we've got going on and just kind of the new things that are out there that we have going and uh, kind of tell our story as well because we do get that question quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Where you know how how do you guys get started and where did you come from or you know how did they, just 
what's the story? What's going on? So, um, yeah, back in uh, back in high school, myself and Michael Hunsucker, we we just became friends through school, and uh, we um, we both bow hunted at the time. And there really weren't that many people in our school that bow hunted, and so just through mutual friends, we kind of met, and that was one of the things that we shared together and enjoyed a lot. So we started kind of bow hunting together, and later on in high school, um, we started filming a little bit, like just jacking around with a handy cam, just not nothing serious whatsoever. And then we uh, we went to college together because we still enjoy bow hunting, and uh, we also were on a trap club or a trap scholarship, I guess you would say at Lindenwood university in St. Louis. And so we both went there and there were other hunters there, obviously. And, uh, we kind of all had like our own little click and we were all just bow hunting together. But Mike and I just seemed to film our hunts even more than, than normal. And any time that we weren't in school, we were, we were hunting or doing something involved with hunting and, uh, filming it as well. And so that kind of brought up the, uh, side of, like a tree arm what they use a solid tree arm there really wasn't a good tree arm on the market at the time and um my dad owned a machine shop um well he still does to this day just a different one and uh we had uh, one of his tool makers build up a tree arm so um from there we uh we basically just manufactured the tree arm that we wanted to put onto the market and we started selling the HB Sniper Pro. And from there, we wanted to show what quality footage came from that arm. And so we decided to start the TV show. And I can't remember. I think we started out on the Man channel, the MAN or something like that. And uh, graduated from there to the Sportsman's channel for a few years. And then from there, like our sixth season, we um, went to the Outdoor channel and have evolved into, into what we are today. That's kind of the the short version there's obviously been a lot of things um along the way but um super blessed to be able to do what what we do we're always always eager to learn something new whether it's the production side the hunting side the management side or whatever it may be and um yeah we just just very very fortunate to be able to 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 do what we're doing today i never would have imagined i'd be doing this back when i was in high school or um, or even college really i didn't know what i wanted to do going through college um kept trying to figure that out and i just decided to get a, a business degree with an emphasis in entrepreneurship and i wasn't even sure if i wanted to own my own company but it, it all kind of evolved to what it is today and so here i am man that's awesome i you know, I, personally, I think a lot of you guys, and I, I know there's a lot of people out there that have, uh, that have the same feelings, and uh, it, sh- I think it shows in media, man. Like, um, you guys were the pioneer of a lot of the things that are happening today. Um, you know, just uh, in in the video film space, um, it seems like to me that you guys kind of started that uh, upper end production value in the outdoor world, and. Uh, Personally, like I said, I, I've followed you guys for a long time now. I guess since you guys kind of started season one, um, so really excited to have you on the phone, man, and then uh, really happy for your journey for sure. I, I uh, definitely support what you guys are doing. I know you guys um, have been doing some burning lately, and um, usually, if you're going to be burning, you're probably burning your own property. Um, and so I think the first thing I'd like to talk about here is just, uh, purchasing a property. Some of the people li- that listen to this might be interested. I know personally, um, I'm interested in uh, property and I don't have one currently, but, uh, I would love to have something around here, uh, local just to be able to manage and kind of get involved with, uh, that whole side of things. So I don't really want the real estate investor perspective, um, unless you, you know, like at the end, you cap it off with a little bit of justification, but, you know, from a deer hunter perspective, um, you know, you guys, the, the properties that you hunt are important to what you guys do. Um, you know, they give you the ability to go out and be effective getting harvest on film. So from somebody who not necessarily would be, uh, looking to film, but just to be effective hunting, uh, what should they be looking for when they're first, uh, looking for properties to buy? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, for one, I want to, I want to kind of start off, um, something like, like if people are ever hesitant about buying land, like, you know, is it a smart thing to do? Yes. 
it is it's one of the smartest investments you can you can make because I mean there there's only a limited supply of it and it's it's only uh it's only getting locked up more and more and smaller tracks are being made rather than, you know, bigger tracks. So buying land is an extremely good investment because the price continues to only go up. I mean, it'll, yeah, it may drop down a little bit, but as time goes on, it's going to continually go up. So you're going to, you're going to told, you're always going to um, have a great investment in that. But um, as far as white sales go, uh, when looking for certain properties, um, I think it's kind of tough uh, in Missouri so I feel like I, I I did a lot of searching prior to it, um, and talked to quite a few people, and I was very very hesitant um, on what piece I wanted to buy. It took me a while, and I was patient, which I think that's really really smart. Don't don't necessarily jump on the first one, uh, the first one that you come across. But looking back, I kind of wish I would have. I was just overly hesitant <laughs> because. Uh, the piece, the piece that I looked at originally, very first one I ever looked at, um, was actually priced right, and it kind of had everything you'd want in a smaller track. It had rolling a big rolling hill that went up into all the cover with warm season grasses um, on the the lower portion of it that led into the timber, and then in the bottom was uh, was where the ag was at, and um, it just kind of had all of it for a recreational piece. I even think it had a pond on it as well. Um, and I, I, it was, like I said, it was priced good. It had income and I just was, I was a little bit scared at the time. I guess I wasn't quite ready. I was just kind of looking, I wasn't quite ready to purchase. I was more or less just looking and getting a feel for it. But, um, anyways, I think when you're looking for something like that, you want something that kind of has it all like that. Um, if there's income on the property, like agriculture like that, um, or CRP paying, um, it's going to be higher priced. In this case, it actually, this one wasn't. And I was just a little nervous. Um, <laughs> so it would have been a great investment. Um, but there are underlying things you got to look for as well. You know, there could be a bottom where there's WRP, which is wetland uh, restoration program. And with the wetland restoration program, um, yes, there, I, I believe there is some sort of income with it, but it will always be in, in a WRP. It's never taken out. There's, well, it's a lifetime term, so it's always going to be kind of like a swamp ground, I guess you would say. So, if there were WRP on it, I, you know, it may be lower priced, and so I think that drives a lot of traffic to it. But if you're gonna if you're gonna buy it, you're gonna always have WRP on it. You can't ever put anything else in there. So right. you got to look for stuff like that. Um, trying to think of some other things that were kind of underlying that I'd come across. Well, neighbors for one, that's another thing that I um that I, I was looking for when I was looking at pieces of property. I found a really really nice piece. It was small, I think it was only like fifty or sixty acres. Um, and I could put ag on there. It was just in pasture at the time, so there was there they weren't drawing any income off the property, but if I were to buy it and put crops on it, I would get income. The only thing was the more I talked to the uh the agent that was selling it the more I realized that the neighbors were, um, were trespassing on that property. And I didn't really want to, I didn't really want to deal with that. Mm-hmm. Um, have coming onto my property with, without permission. And, um, so that kind of drew me away from that. Um, just getting to know the neighbors and, and what's surrounding the piece is, is really important as well. Um, trying to think of any un- other underlying things that might kind of be in the way. Um, Access, yeah, that's another big one. If there's just one point of access onto the piece of property uh, and you have to go through all the cover to get to where you want to hunt or anything and you're going to spook all the deer out, it's probably uh, it's probably not a good thing. Right. Um, so I'm always looking for that. Um, and that was kind of the reason that I ended up buying the piece that I did buy is it has a couple access points. Um, actually, it has three access points and potentially another one. Um, and so it's, it's only an 80 acre piece, it's not really big, but it's, I think it's a perfect piece for the average blue collar guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can actually, so you can access it from three or four different areas. It's got a ton of cover. Um, the one thing it doesn't have is any income as far as agriculture, mm-hmm. but I really wasn't looking for that as a whitetail hunter necessarily. I, I was more attracted to all the cover that it has 
right. all the brushy stuff and all the big stand of timber. Sure. Um, and I was able to also put in some food plots. I've got uh, an open area, but it's rolling pasture, so I put I drilled in alfalfa there, so the uh, the roots will still hold the dirt together and it won't erode. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just something I can go in and maintain with mowing, and I can spray it to keep the weeds down. Um, and then I also have a lower food plot that's probably only maybe a half acre that I've got in clover and then one other food plot that I'm going to turn into a uh, brassica mix but um, basically with the surrounding properties on, on two sides of it are just um, wide open cattle pasture so there's not really any deer hanging out there and then on the other side other two sides are, are uh, bigger blocks of timber so it's more or less like a travel corridor I feel like for, for deer passing through it and so, I mean, it, it holds some deer, but they're definitely moving uh, back and forth between mine and the neighbor's property. Yeah, man, it sounds like an awesome place. And, you know, I, I too, can, am kind of at that point in life where I'm really starting to explore the, explore the options of buying a property, of course, as an investment, but, you know... <laughs> Let's be honest. Every time I look at a property, I'm always thinking deer, you know, and like, what's, how is this going to hunt? What's it going to do? Is it worth it for the whitetailer standpoint? Um, and I'm very guilty of looking at a property and assessing it for what it is and not seeing what it could be. Like I want, I want that property that's kind of set up, maybe not like with food plots and everything, but like, I want the cover to be there. I want the the forage to be there. I want the water to be there. And if it's not, I, you know, keep looking. But I don't look at the things that I can do to change it to make it better. When you look at a property, mm-hmm. what's what's some of the more easier things that, like, maybe something doesn't have but are easy to put in or easy to change, e- easy to make habitat ma- manipulations to? Well, a lot of people don't really uh, think much about timber um, in Missouri, especially i feel like um you know you'll look at a block of timber and they may want to look at logging it and yeah you can you can get you can get some income there but you also it needs to be a selective harvest i feel like um you can't just go in and uh do what they call like a high grade where they just take all um mature trees off because then that just leaves your less desirable trees there to to Mm. thrive and then you just have a a really bad stand of timber um So I think that that's something that you should definitely pay attention to. What kind of timber stand does it have? Are there like heavy oaks? Are there walnuts that are in there? Um, Are there a lot of good hardwoods that are still, they're standing on the piece of property. And in Missouri, you can go to your, um, the conservation department, Missouri department, department of conservation and apply for a timber stand improvement project on your property. And they'll give you an option of either doing it yourself or, um, hiring a uh, contractor to come in and complete the, the timber stand improvement uh, for you. I, I am choosing to do it on my own, which it doesn't matter either way, but you have to apply for this, and there's uh, actually uh, state funding for that that's allocated each year. And Missouri has, I believe, the, uh, the wealthiest uh, conservation department in the country. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure i just know there's a ton of funding there and so they allocate this money for timber stain improvements and if you are selected out of the number of people that apply um they will fund you a certain amount per acre for timber stain improvement um to be done on your property and what that basically includes is a forester will come in and evaluate the property and take a uh, inventory of the trees and the timber uh, in this unit that you want to be selected for the timber stand improvement and what trees are good and going to stay and what trees need to be removed. Um, I, I could go into some technical terms, but it might kind of be above everyone's head. Um, <laughs> but essentially, yeah, essentially they're just going to come in and um, tell you what, what you're going to, what you can get out of your farm as far as income to complete this process and they'll pay per acre. You can, you could, uh, if you do it yourself, you basically have to, you would have to, uh, if you don't know how, you'd have to research how to complete a timber stand improvement and go in and uh, girdle or um, girdle the trees or basically just remove the less desirable ones and treat them with, uh, with Tordon, which is a, um, a 
basically just a tree killer. And yeah, so I'm kind of, I feel like I'm trailing off here, but <laughs> there's funding available for, for timber stand improvements on your farm. Mm-hmm. And then the CRP as well. If you can, if you can get um, areas of your farm put into CRP, that's another source of income. Um, it's also desirable for the, for the wildlife. Sure. Yeah. Not pertaining to your farm, not pertaining to anybody in Missouri or elsewhere. Overall, just why is why would you burn? What's the general concept and the, the idea behind burning a property? Well, um, for one, before you even do a burn, make sure you know um, what you're doing. And you can just seek professional help there if you have no idea what you're doing and you never you've never done it before because the last thing you want is for fire to get out. It's that then you're, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Then it, it could be a huge problem. You could get in a lot of trouble. But, um, some of the reasons that we do burn is basically to reduce fire hazards, um, fuels and stuff on the, the forest floor or even, um, in a field. Um, there's just a lot of fuel sitting there. Um, if, if it's not, especially if it's never been burned or been decades since it has been burned. And that's, a huge reason why fires have started out west every year, big giant fires, because um, you know that stuff used to, those forests used to always be essentially naturally burned off on their own um, through just wildfires, and that stuff's been basically stopped um, because of you know human invasion. You don't you know they don't want fires going crazy and people's homes being destroyed. So now there's a lot of fuel sitting on the on the forest floor. And these fires start and basically just rage. Um, but anyhow, just reduce just your hazardous fuels that are on the on the forest floor. Um, and then there's a lot of debris that needs to be re- removed um, that may be sitting on the floor, the forest floor, like dead trees and stuff like that. So it helps clean it up and make it a lot better uh, or a lot more appeasing to the eye, and just it looks better in the timber. Um, and really, the, the main reason that we do it is to improve the wildlife habitat, um, whether it's just in a field of uh, native grasses or in the timber. If there's sunlight reaching the floor, your your habitat's going to be better. All your native plants are going to thrive from that. Um, as far as your trees go, it'll help remove less desirable small trees um, or some invasive species not all and some of them will actually be will thrive from it which is kind of a bad thing when you have to you have to treat those but um in missouri i can't speak for other states we have uh what's it, it's called uh multi rose and it's just a nasty invasive bush that's uh thorny and if there's sap flow going through it and you run a fire through it uh typically if it gets hot enough it'll burn that plant up and it will not come back so it helps remove that so if that's being removed all your leaves that were sitting on the forest floor are removed now your other plants like your your native forbs and uh and other plants that are the seedlings that are on the floor are actually exposed to sunlight and they can grow so it helps do that it helps manage competing vegetation like i was saying um maybe there's you know five little saplings coming up right next to each other and one of them, you know, three or four of them are weak and two of them are really strong. Well, it's going to eliminate those three probably. And the other two are going to thrive and outcompete the smaller one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what it does there. Um, with the grasses, um, it, it just removes all that thatch. So like the, you know, the, the dead grass that fell over from the year before, once it went dormant, mm-hmm. it helps remove that. And so then when the the grass says cool season or warm season come back up in the spring, there's, you know, there's not all that fats that has to grow through. So this year, uh, what projects are you working on? What, what, uh, what are y'all burning and why? Um, basically just, uh, a few different Savannah grass areas, open or open grass areas. And then, um, some timber, but like I was saying, we have one area on my, my dad's farm. I haven't done it on mine yet, but we just um, completed a timber stand improvement project on a block of timber. And so most of these trees, not most of them, but like a percentage of trees were removed. And a lot of these uh, these mature oaks were left. 
that they were already there that are now they don't have to compete with you know 40 other trees right around them just a few others and they're a giant tree that also opened up the uh the canopy to where sunlight can reach the forest floor so we're burning the timber floor so that all those plants and other small trees can thrive on the on the forest floor and come back up cool so uh, i've got a question for you uh that i know we're kind of concentrating on whitetail stuff and for good reasons because mm-hmm. we all love to hunt hunt uh big bucks and does and everything but uh so i'm a general a generalist when it comes to outdoor opportunity i love to i love birding i love to shoot small game i even have a bug collection at home and it's kind of weird but <laughs> um <laughs> so uh do you ever take like time of year into consideration or anything when it comes to these burning like you know say a uh, warm season grass thicket that grew up you know where you're trying to get rid of that thatch and all that from the past past seasons do you take uh time of year or just like say the small game insects birds or whatever may be nesting in there at that time of year do you burn at specific times or temperatures or weather conditions to avoid you know taking out that section of uh, wildlife absolutely yeah that's a really really good question um we do think about that stuff all the time and it it's super tedious as well because right now there's quite a bit of stuff that we we need to burn on our farm um up north i was going to burn today here in in central missouri where the where it's a little bit drier but up north it's super super wet and so that's kind of delaying our burning Mm -hmm. and that's fine, but with being that, with that being said, like I don't want to get into into mid April and and you know it's it's finally dried out enough or whatever for us to burn. And there's turkeys laying eggs and other sorts of animal, other sorts of birds that are that might have nests on the ground or something like that, and go in and burn them all up. So yeah, we try to get most of our timber stuff done um, by now. Yeah, um, it just. It's just a matter of if it's dry enough or the conditions are right. And so here pretty quick, if we do um, get the right conditions, we'll get in, into the timber and get the rest of what we want burned off. Um, and that kind of goes the same for uh, most of our open savannas with the, with the grass and stuff. Um, but some we do burn later on. Um, for instance, I have some uh, two smaller areas. One One's maybe like half acre, and then the other one's probably three acres. Um, on my farm that are basically overtaken by fescue and I don't, I mean, I have no desire to have fescue, uh, grown on my farm. I'd rather it come back into native grasses, which are mainly warm season grasses. Well, these are cool season grasses. So when they start to grow, it'll in green up, it'll be, uh, your cool season, which is like April and May. Mm-hmm. And so if you go in and burn those as they're starting to green up, it'll really knock them back quite a bit to where the warm season grasses can actually come through in in July and uh, June and July and start to grow grow through where you just burned and uh, out-compete that best. So you give some, you take some on that. Like, yeah, there. I mean, there could potentially be um, nesting going on in there, but um, there's quite a bit of other cover that will be left untouched, you know, where I'm not going to be burning this year to where they could they could have other nests and, and wildlife can move to like i wouldn't want to go in just burn off you know several hundred acres on my dad's farm um because then that that's going to push all your wildlife out they're not going to have any cover right there left Mm -hmm. um so we do it in certain small units throughout so that um they have a chance to to move um and we don't burn off like we don't go and burn off um the whole farm each year it's just small units and different different places each year and so we'll give we'll give areas a break for one, maybe even three years each time. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a pretty narrow window in there when it's, you know, like a good time to burn. And I guess it's it's all dependent on what you're trying to do with the with the uh, property and all. Yeah. And yeah. And like you could you could start in January, February if the conditions are right. But that's another thing we run into is like I don't want to go in and burn off. Um, the cover that we have for the deer and especially if they haven't shed yet yeah. so <laughs> it, you know it's going to drive them off your farm and then they're going to be over on the neighbors and they're probably going to shed over there um and you're not going to find their sheds yeah those pesky but neighbors. yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> i mean that, that, that is how I, i'm sure 
pretty much 99% of us are thinking, you know, you want, you want the buck to, to shed on your property. Sure. Yeah. You know, and so, so uh, yeah, we, we try to try to pay attention to that as well. Yeah. So I, you know, I would think that the, the burning is, uh, it's not a yearly thing, so you kind of have to keep up with what you've done where. Uh, do you have any specific way of like remembering, like, hey, I did this place four years ago and it was intensive, or uh, we did, you know, a minor burn here, or can you just, are you good with your mind like that? You can just keep up with it. We we've, we've pretty well kept up with it. Yeah. Um, if we were more organized on that end, I think we we probably could uh, write that stuff down, but we we haven't. Um, it uh, I've yet to run into something like that to where I, I forgot. Um, last year conditions this time of year were unbelievable. Like it was almost, it was super dry up there. Um, it was actually too dry most of the time to where we were under like burn warnings and, mm-hmm. um, we get low. That's another thing. I don't know if, if, if uh, anybody's familiar with it or not, but when you do burn, um, you have the conditions have to be right as far as the humidity levels. They need to be below fifty percent, and your relative humidity. And if it gets down to like thirty or below, mm-hmm. that's when stuff can light up. I mean, like their clothes could catch on fire, no problem when they get that low. And that's what was going on last year when it was so dry. So we go and we light stuff up, and those fires were great. They had a lot of heat, and we had to be super careful to make sure your fire didn't get out of your line or anything like that. And it was good because we got a really hot burn in some areas in the timber where we haven't done TSI yet. Um, or we just had a really bad stand from the previous owner he went in and had a lot of the mature trees cut out of there. So we've got a lot of softwood trees and stuff that we didn't really want. So that hot fire went in and really torched some of those, those, uh, those trees that we didn't really want there. So that was, that was kind of cool, but at the same time, it's like, all right, you got to be, you got to be really careful. Yeah. So, I mean, what's the best way to kind of curb the anxiety of burning for somebody who's never done that? There is a ton of information out there online. Um, that's really, I mean, outside of uh, Joel, one of our 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 guys, he uh, he works for the conservation department, um, so he was extremely familiar with with how to do a prescribed burn. But prior to that, I, you know, or other than that, I've researched a lot of it on my own. And, and there's also workshops that, um, our conservation department puts on, um, or you could, I'm sure you can find all sorts of different stuff online. Um, as far as other workshops in your area that, uh, might be going on. Um, I was going to ask number, if you'd number, taken any classes or anything, uh, to, to learn I more about this. Person, I should <laughs> I should. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel, you know, it's, it's easy for me to sit here and say that I feel like I know it all. Um, but as soon as you think that, you definitely don't. Um, mm-hmm. So I have not, um, but I have looked into quite a bit of stuff online. And being around Joel, he he is certified in that stuff, and he he's actually gone out west and fought a lot of uh, fires. So being around him and kind of mentoring him and seeing what's going on, I've learned quite a bit. Um, and, uh, yeah, something else that I meant to say is the number one thing that we actually use to, um, keep our fires in control is a, a backpack blower. Um, I remember the first time that I, I learned about that, you know, we, we had a backpack blower out there and it was like, what, what do we need with this thing? Why, why do we have this? You know, I just always, it was, just, we, you, you know, you put it out with a rake or with water or something. Mm-hmm. Well, we can't, you can't haul that much water out there. So. Yeah, we use a backpack blower and just you blow the fire out, and it it works extremely well. That's probably the that's definitely the number one thing to to use to control a fire. But like I'm saying, like it it's best to be uh, to be educated on any of this stuff um, prior to ever doing it. Um, wind speed, you don't you don't want a, a real high, because um, then your fire could burn out. And another thing is. Uh, to, to use a disc and disking your burn line so mm-hmm. your fire can't go out. Um, but yeah, I would just say highly recommend just looking in the, to uh, the right ways to do it and go about it. Yeah, sure. So do you ever, uh, well, let me give you a little bit of a scenario. So say you want to burn an area 
to start anew and plant your food plot in that in that spot. You know, say you're planting clover or something that needs a good seed bed, as opposed to uh, like if you're just going to burn an area to kind of control the amount of grass that is is built up there and have the same stuff come up again. Uh, do you structure those fires differently, or do them on different types of days or different wind speeds or something to get different results? Um, not necessarily. Uh, as far as burning um, for a food plot or just you know burning um, like grass to promote other grasses, it's kind of all relative there. If you want, so if you wanted, you, you want it to be dry enough, regardless, to where. You're not just burning off a little bit of thatch on the top and then everything underneath that's wet stays there. Um, you want it to be dry enough so that it, a lot of, pretty much everything is removed and burned off. Um, if you were just burning off an area to, uh, to put a food plot, yeah, you, it's the same thing. You just want it to be, to be dry enough to where it removes all that thatch, but you're still going to have to go in and, um, and disc it up to basically kill off anything that is going to come back. You'd have to wait for it to green up. And, um, I think I can't remember the exact length of the plants, but I would assume it's around like six inches. You got to wait till it grows about six inches before you come in and spray it. But if you were going to disc it, you just let it come back a little bit and then could go in and disc it up to where you just have just dirt. But, um, the only other thing that we is different as far as burning conditions is, um, in the timber, you need, you need a lot lower humidity levels. So I said 50%. That's kind of, that's mainly for grasses. If I was going to burn the timber, I'd probably want it to be around 40% relative humidity and have about a mm, 10 to 15 mile per hour wind. Whereas if I were just burning grass, you only need about a 5 to 10. Um, and if you have anything above 15 on grass, you might not want to do that because <laughs> Yeah, it's gonna run, it's gonna run a lot quicker just because the the fuel for the fire, the fat that's on the ground, is, is a lot drier and thicker than in the timber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you guys deal with cedars much, and does that worry you if you do? Um, you're talking about the uh, the tree, right? Yeah, like a you know when you're burning the timber. Um, you know, I, I mean, whether it's dead or green, a lot of times I've seen some cedars go up pretty quick. <laughs> So I was just yeah. wondering if you guys ever have have struggles with that in the timber. Um, not in the timber, no. Uh, typically, because our uh, the flames don't usually get that high unless it's one of, like last year, like I was saying, when it was really dry and had low humidity. Um, typically, not in the timber. They they don't usually light. The only time that they'll ever light is in those open areas of uh of grass so like our open savannas we, we have a lot of cedars and really it's only about the first time that you go in and burn those areas that that those cedars light up and if you have a good disc line around your whole um your whole burn area there's really nothing to worry about um they'll light up mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll burn down and they won't come back um because it kills them but um no, we've never really had too many issues with the cedars. It's pretty cool to watch them burn, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Especially for a pyro like myself. Um, yeah, I know, that's, that's, that's where that's kind of how I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had way too many fireworks as a kid, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, how long? Um, how long does it take you to come back to a section after you've burned it and say, "Well, we need to do this one again." Um, well, it just depends on what's in there. Um, if it's kind of a, like we have one area on the farm that, uh, that has a ton of, ton of little, like, uh, I think they're like pin oaks that came up all at once. So I don't know if there was a pasture there 30, 40 years ago or what was going on there, but there were no mature trees and. You know, it may have been grazed at, at that time and then just left alone. And then all of these trees came up at once. And so they're all trying to outcompete one another. And they still are to this day, but they're all the same size. They're all probably like 6 to 12 inches in diameter. So there's a bunch of thick trees in there. And we've gone through, I mean, there's there's no room uh, in the canopy for sunlight to hit hardly. So there's no, there's no small vegetation on the forest floor. So we've gone in there 
and burned off that leaf crop or leaf fall not crop. Um, <laughs> and uh, we've waited till that you know the conditions are right for a real hot fire, and when we do that, it's burning a lot of those trees and hitting them pretty hot. And so it, like I was saying earlier, it thins out um, a bunch of those a bunch of those less desirable trees, the ones that that aren't as strong as the other ones and the uh, the stronger ones thrive and make it through. So with that being said, those weaker ones are dying off, which open up sunlight for it to hit the forest floor, and it's just kind of regenerating growth at the bottom. So stuff like that will go in and will burn. Uh, we've been burning almost every year. Um, we, we've given it, I think, a year or two rest here and there. Um, but until we feel like, you know, that, that stand of forest looks good enough to where we have healthy, mature trees and uh, sunlight sitting on the floor and there's vegetation growing on the ground, then we'll start to back off on how many times we burn it. Um, as far as, like, the grasslands go, we try to give those. If, the, if it's a really good stand of warm season grasses we'll, uh, and there's not much cool season growing in there, um, we'll give it mm, two, three years rest before we go back in and burn it again. Um, so once, once you get closer to the point to where you're, you're happy with it, that's probably when we back off on the burn a little bit and give it a little more rest. Mm -hmm. So are those grasslands, um, are they regenerating in one year enough to give like adequate cover for, for deer? Yeah. Um, it just kind of depends on, on what was there to begin with. Uh, when we got the place, I was actually just looking at pictures the other day. I think, I think my dad purchased his property that, that that's the main piece that we own, by the way. And it's the biggest uh, piece that we do <laughs> most of our, our management stuff on. But, um, uh, yeah, we, uh, I was looking at pictures earlier this week, actually five years ago. And this one stand that we have is probably the best on the farm is it's just like the perfect stand of warm season grasses and I actually put it on HB's story the other day um, and when we first got it it was kind of a mix between the two between warm season and some cool season and fescue and stuff like that and I think we burned it three or four times in that five year span um, so I think we only gave it one year off and now it's to the point to where I mean I'm not I'm not going to burn it this year we burned it last year and I probably won't burn it next year either if it, if it looks about the same the year after that, I will just because of the the uh, layers of fats that are that'll be on the ground just to try and remove those. But um, yeah, so there there's certain areas that that look really good, and there's others that still need work. Mm -hmm. Cool. So when you do burn like that, how do you know what's coming up is what you want? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, and I'll give I'll give credit again to Joel on that. That's that's another thing that I've, that I've been learning as we go is what, what is good and what's bad. There's, there are invasive species that'll thrive off of that fire that I wouldn't have known otherwise about if I, if really, if I hadn't kind of mentored Joel on that. And he, like I said, he learned all this stuff um, working for the Missouri Department of Conservation, but all this information is also online, which I've, I've researched as well on my own because I, you know, I've asked him so many times, what's this, what's this, what's this, and it gets to be probably repetitive with him, and then I want to I want to learn a lot of it on my own when I'm sitting at home thinking about it, so I've researched it. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just something you really have to learn. It's not like you're going to go out there and, and know what's good and what's bad. Um, we want the warm season grasses to thrive and the, the native plants that come up in the spring after we burn. Like, we'll burn, for instance, one of these grasslands, and we'll go walking through there uh, – a month into the spring or during turkey season or whatever, and Joel's calling out all these different types of native plants that are popping up. So, you know, he's like, oh, there's Indian paintbrush. Oh, they, you know, like all these different names and uh, purple cone flowers coming up right there. Just all sorts of native plants are coming up. And so a lot of it I've learned through him, uh, like I was saying. But um, the invasive species are like Cerecia lespediza, and that's, that's just a native, like not native, but it's a it's a uh, a plant in Missouri that's actually found kind of all over the place. And if you go in and you burn that, um, it 
thrives off of it. And once it's, hmm. once it's, it's just, it spreads like fire essentially. And it chokes out all of the other plants below it. And so after a few years of burning it, your whole field would probably be covered in it. And that's <laughs> all that would be growing there. So <laughs> when you, when you run into something, yeah, when you run into something like that, it's, it's more or less you got to know what you're looking at and what you're looking for and what you're burning. And if there's, if that stuff's growing, you need to, you need to kill it. Um, and again, you just have to research, uh, what, what to kill it with, whatever the plant may be, like that stuff you kill with, uh, a, uh, a product called Pasture Guard. So, mm-hmm. so at that, at that very, I'm, what's that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so at that point in time, you're, uh, resorting to spraying as opposed to burning. Like you got to bring in a, a different type of implement. Yeah. And that, and that's another time period when you have to do that. We do that one in the summertime. Uh-huh. Um, once the plants kind of like that invasive species has, um, basically matured and it, you know, it's got all like, it's, I don't know, got all of its leaves and everything or whatever, whatever it would be called that it grows. And then it has, if you, if you do it too late, it won't absorb the uh, the herbicide, mm-hmm. and it, you know it won't be. But so you have to do it when it's like fully bloomed or whatever mm-hmm. um, to where it's absorbed. Um, and by the way, on all of this stuff, I'm still learning, so I might sound <laughs> like I know exactly what I'm talking about, but I'm still learning all of it. I'm by I'm not an expert yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know way more than I do, so I'm glad to get to pick your brain <laughs> on it. Yeah, I'm just reiterating the knowledge that I've learned. Yeah, well, the past five years. That's all. That's all anybody does. Like, there's no new knowledge. You know, we just learn something from someone else and then tell the other person. But so you're, you're doing good, man. <laughs> um, so around here, pretty much all summer, the deer just chow down on forbs, uh, like goldenrod and stuff like that. Is there a specific way to burn to promote the growth of forbs? Like, is there a time period, or how would you do that? Uh, other than what we what we've been doing as far as burning this time of year before any vegetation has come up, mm-hmm. um, that's the only the only thing that I know to promote forbs, native forbs, um, unless there are like I was saying, like unless there's um, fescue growing there or an invasive species. And I'm not sure if fescue is is labeled as an invasive species or not, but I do know that it cho- it really chokes out everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, you can go in also, and you could burn it this time of year um, before it's, it's um, greened up at all. And I'm, I guess, I'm referring to the Midwest, maybe not down there where you guys live, because everything's probably greened up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, um, yes, it, it, it's pretty green. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not here, but uh, yeah. So, like, if it, if it, uh, if it hasn't greened up, and we went in and burnt fescue, um, it's just going to promote it and it's going to thrive off of it yeah. because your cool season month is about to happen. Mm-hmm. So uh, if I did do that, um, I would go and I wanted to get rid of it. I'd go in, uh, like I was saying earlier, when it gets to about six inches tall or whatever, uh, or six inches to about a foot tall, and I'd go in and spray it with um, with Roundup just to kill it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So... so you, and, your, your native, some of your native forbs may be coming in a little bit with it, but at least, and you may kill them, but your main objective is to get rid of that fescue first. Yeah, yeah, sure, and and that'll get it done. So, I guess uh, being where we're at and having an early green up can kind of be a good thing for for burning purposes. Like, at least if you're trying to get rid of like you know something undesirable like that fescue, we get that green up earlier because our cool season's earlier, and it gives us you know, I guess more of a summertime growing season. Now, the thing we have to watch out for down here is that we hardly ever get those humidity days like you're talking about. (laughs) Like it can, it's usually just hot and sticky, you know, and then, uh, you got to get on things early because, uh, at least in our area of the state, uh, there's pretty much a burn ban from June till September about every year. So we have to, (laughs) you know, pretty be kind of cautious of that but i guess this is kind of simplistic and maybe it's just because i'm an uh, amateur at it but uh i would think that whenever you're going to burn a a piece of property uh you don't just like light a fire in one place and hope it goes out from there uh i've seen it done i suppose where you're trying to light a line of fire and then allow the wind to carry it across the property evenly what's the best way to make that happen yeah, that's, an, that's another really good question. Um, wind direction is is uh, key 
and then also uh, elevation, which I'm not, I'm not sure uh, where you guys are at in Texas, but if you have very many hills um, mm-hmm. and changes in elevation, that also will change it because your thermal and everything else changes as well. But like, if there were a hill um, and you were burning um, into, like, say. Say your wind's blowing into that hill, going up it. But once your fire hits that hill, it's gonna it's gonna go even faster. Once it hits that, it's gonna just mm-hmm. rush right up it. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But with the wind direction, um, we're always we always light what you call like a black line, and that's um, on the uh, the downwind side of where the area you want to burn. So mm-hmm. we'll go in. And first off, you want to make sure it's this or or super wet or whatever it may be on the back side of where you're going to light this. Sure. And uh, light this black line. And then if there's anything going back, like with the wind, you want to put that out with your blower. And then your back, your black line is going to slowly feed upwind. So it's actually going to burn slowly into the wind. And then you'll circle your way back all the way around. And then you'll you'll light your back fire and it just burns right through your, your, uh, your area that you're wanting to burn. Cool, cool. So I've seen a tool um, that people use. I don't know what it is. I just want to know if you've used it. It looks like some type of like an oil vessel or something, and they just walk down a line, and a drip of fire falls like every foot or so, and it kind of creates like a line for the whole fire to go across. You ever use one of those, or you know what it's called? Yeah, that's called a drip torch, and um, basically it's, it's just your your fuel that's inside of it is uh, three parts diesel, one part unleaded fuel, mm-hmm. and it's just mixed up in there. And then um, so it goes out this little tube out the end of it, and on the end of your tube is like a little, uh, oh, I don't know what the material is, but it, it essentially soaks up that fuel that's coming out of there, and you, you'll light that on fire, and as you're going along, your fuel's coming out, and it's going past that, through that flame, this, this lit on the end on your torch, mm-hmm. and your drip torch. And, um, so your fuel is lighting through the air, and it take, it's taking the flame through the air, and, it's la- and once it lands, that's where it, it sits, and that's where it, it obviously expands and starts starts your fire. Gotcha. Um, and so, don't, yeah, you don't want to use just straight on lead because... <laughs> no, that would be bad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's too flammable. Well, it won't... I, it won't actually, I don't think, I, I've never tried this and I wouldn't recommend it, but I don't think it'll actually even, I don't think it would go back into your, into your torch. Um, mm-hmm. But like I've had where we've had a bad mix to where we've had a little too much unleaded. And so when your, your fuel goes through that flame, it burns up before you hit the ground. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can see so that. It just won't burn. So. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sounds a little dangerous and a lot of fun. So it's kind of my kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, like I, yeah, and like, all, like, like I was saying, if you're going to do it, make sure you seek professional help first and sure. do your research stuff out there and, and be a dummy and light a fire and it yeah. gets out because that's the last thing. You, you want to be extra cautious and safe when you're doing this stuff. Yeah. It can be, I mean, it can be really effective and good, but it can also be extremely dangerous and <laughs> You don't want the wrong thing to happen. Yeah. It's not the first time someone's told me to seek professional help, so I think, <laughs> I think that would be right or something. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, you know, I follow y'all's uh, uh, social media pages and stuff, and I see you've been doing a lot of burning, and you find a lot of sheds while you're burning. Do you uh, mm-hmm. shed hunt with fire, or is, do you just end up finding sheds while you burn? Because I would think you wouldn't want the <laughs> sheds to be as charred, yeah. but I don't know. It, it's funny. It's funny because... A lot of times we'll be like, man, like, this is such a big block of timber. Like, I know there's sheds laying in there, and we've walked it, and we can't find them. And we're like, we're going to light this thing on fire anyway. But we've walked it enough. I'm tired of it. Let's just, uh, let's just look again. Let's just burn. And so we'll burn, and we'll, we'll go in there and pick up some sheds. But, no, we don't ever intentionally burn just to find sheds. But, because it, sometimes if the fire is hot enough, it'll, it doesn't fully burn them up, but it'll char them up. And then, like, if it's really hot, the tips will start to like your time will start to break and stuff like that and, yeah i mean they're not as good looking as they once were so yeah it's, we never we never burn just a fine shed yeah but it is fun to come up afterwards 
Yeah, yeah, it makes it pretty easy to just say, hey, there's a white thing out there in that black stuff. There must be a shed. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, another thing for strange intentional burnings. Um, around here, oftentimes, habitat's pretty monotonous. Uh, and deer can be difficult to pattern, as they are in most places, but if you can get a pattern down, it's good. Uh, have you ever burned an area, say, late in the summer, or maybe even early fall to maybe uh, funnel deer movement away from that burned area? And uh, side note, I guess, to the question, is that even an ethical thing to do? And if you believe so, yes or no, and, and why? Well, first off, no, I actually hadn't. And I hadn't even thought about doing that mm-hmm. right there. I never really thought about that. Uh, man, that's a that's a tough question. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and I don't know. I don't know the answer to it how much they would actually avoid it either um yeah if it were a big if it were a really big piece i would i would think that they would avoid you know the center of it and stuff like that um but as far as the edges go i would assume they'd still go i mean i've seen deer go through burns this time of year that are i mean areas that have already been burned um i've seen them go through there um this time of year but i don't don't know during the fall that's that's a tough question out i mean i i personally wouldn't do it um and that's what like they're there are good times actually during the fall to burn that I've heard. I've never done it. Uh, but the reason being, I guess, in, in the forest, if you were to go in and burn in the fall, um, it it's more liable to kill off your inv- like invasive species that are in there, where like if you had multifloral rose or rosebush honeysuckle that's grown in there because the sap flow is uh, going back down into the roots that time of year mm-hmm. because it's becoming dormant. And so if you had a fire that you kept through there and it burns that cambium layer, which is the outer layer inside the park, um, while the sap flow is going down, it cuts it off and basically chokes out the plant and it ends up dying. Um, mm-hmm. So it is, I've heard that it's a good thing to burn sometimes in the timber in the fall, but I've never personally done it. And it's one of those things that I'm, I'm unsure of and I probably won't do it just because that time of year I'm like hunting. Yeah, and, <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I, and, yeah, and there are, like you, you're saying, like there are areas that I don't, you know, most of the areas I, I want there to be covered, I don't want to remove it that time of year, so I, I've just never done it. Yeah, yeah, sure. But I could also see the benefits of that, you know, fall burning as far as like uh, what we talked about earlier with the small game because all your young of the year is going to, you know, be older, more mature. You're going to have less insects in the woods, uh and, you know, all your birds are going to be south, so I'm sure you'd, you'd kind of have a lot less collateral damage as, as well if you were to burn in the fall. True. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Yeah. Um, I don't know about, yeah, the fall stuff, that would be, that's a, a different book that I've never opened, and I don't know if I ever will just because of me hunting that time of year and being in the woods. So. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I understand, man. So are you... Um, are you doing anything like say you have a big white oak tree and a big block of timber that you you want to make sure that thing survives because it's a big draw to your property for deer? Um, are you doing anything to pre- to prepare that tree before you burn to make sure it survives, or do you just burn around it? No, we just burn burn around it. <laughs> yeah. um, basically, it, those big trees. I mean, you would have you have to get a really, really, really hot fire to yeah. uh, to kill that tree because, like I was saying, to you have to burn that whole cambium layer around the tree. So you'd have to have a fire that went up probably I don't know three, four foot or more up that tree, and it has to be really hot and sitting there burning um, constantly to get inside of that tree. Um, you could have a hot fire and it could go through really quickly and the tree would be fine. They call that like a flash burn. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you had a slow, really, really slow, hot, hot burn, and it kind of went up that tree, um, and it gets into that sap flow inside that tree, that's when uh, that's when it would kill it off. But no, it, I don't, we don't usually worry about that. Um, like a lot of the locust trees, they're undesirable hardwoods, just nasty trees. Mm-hmm. Um, some of our fires, if the, especially if they go through a grassland and there's a, a, a locust tree in there, the sap flows, um, there's a lot of sap flow actually through those trees and the fire will climb right up those trees and kill them. So mm-hmm. uh, with those trees, I'm fine with that. But as far as an oak goes, then... Yeah. Are, are you noticing... Very few. 
this is just kind of a side note to to burning, but are you noticing uh, deer eating the locust bean pods? Um, they I've seen them. Uh, I've seen them eat them uh, on farms that I've hunted where there's really no food source. Right. Um, right. On a lot of the stuff that we've been managing lately, we have a high density of food sources um, and a, a lot of variety to where they they don't typically eat that stuff. Yeah. Um, but there's a place here. Uh, close to where we live that Mike's had uh, Mike's had control of for probably 10 years now, but we really haven't done any any sort of management as far as um, land management goes on there. And we, yeah, we try to shoot does and stuff like that and let bucks grow to mature age. But as far as the trees and stuff like that goes, we it's kind of just overgrown with invasive trees and there's a lot of locust trees and not, not many good hard trees. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of locust pots, and I have seen them eat those there, but yeah, outside of that. <clears throat> well, cool. So I want to switch gears here just for a couple more minutes here. And, um, you know, you guys spent some time with the Missouri Department of Conservation recently. Um, what uh, what can you disclose about what happened there? Really, um, our the reason that we set it up um, was we were – we were wanting to hear their take on Missouri's rifle season and why it was in the middle of the rut. And we also wanted to hear their reasoning behind um, CWD in Missouri, um, chronic wasting disease, which was found, I believe, in two, the first case was found in 2010 in Missouri, and why their, what their method was of um, trying to control it and why. And so first off, with the Missouri rifle season thing, us, being only bow hunters, I mean, I'll be honest, it is, it's a little aggravating um, having rifle season right in the middle of the rut because, you know, we're in the woods and we're we're spending, we spent most of our season in the woods in that time of year, the deer obviously running around and their guards down, and then, you know, everybody shows up in their orange with their guns and starts shooting at them, and we're trying to, we're stuck here still trying to bow hunt, so it's aggravating, but um, their take behind it is, kind of been a tradition that's uh that's been started and um they listen to uh they listen to the hunters feedback um people fill out their surveys at the end of the year and for the most part the ones that have been sent in um have all said that they want to not all of them but the majority have said that they want rifle season to be kept during the rut um and if that were to be changed for one they you know people would have to say they want it moved And Mm -hmm. two, they have to look at other options of how they're going to also control Missouri's deer population because, I mean, we do have a very high density of deer. Uh, Some people might say otherwise. Um, This is based off many surveys and a lot of data that they've they've captured to to come up with this stuff. And, um, yeah, so those things would have to happen to get it moved. Uh, I think we're a rare case as far as what we've got going on. We've got a pretty good chunk of land. And we try to manage it the best that we can. We've got a high density of deer. We try to try to keep the ratio in check as far as bucks to does. Um, not very many people necessarily have that luxury like we do. Um, so it's not just up to us if we want if we can have it moved. We just really wanted to hear what they had to say and you know what would influence that to have it moved. Um, yeah. Right. And it's it's essentially up to the the population of hunters and and the majority of what they want. So yeah. if you got if if anybody out there has uh, you know has something that they want to see changed, they need to make sure that they voice their opinion to their conservation department and For sure. fill out any surveys that to them. Um, that's one thing that I think that a lot of people neglect, um, including myself. I've done it before. I've gotten that in the mail and been like, oh, this <laughs> nothing's going to change here. You know, why would I fill that out? They're not going to listen. Well, they do. Um, they showed us They showed us the data that they have on that. And um, if you ever wanted any of that data, it's, it's open to the public. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, on that, that side, um, that's, that was their take on, on rifle season. And then uh, chronic wasting disease, <laughs> that's something that I think everybody needs to really be aware of. It really opened up my eyes. I wasn't, I wasn't too worried about it prior to that meeting. I didn't think that it was... Um, you know, that scary of a subject, um, but it really is. The, I think that 
the nation's deer herd is uh, definitely threatened by it because it is such a, a fatal disease. And I know people think that, oh, well, it's never killed any deer. Um, you know, they may get it, but it doesn't actually kill them. They live it out. Well, they don't. They actually do die from it. And it's extremely fatal, and um, it's extremely aggressive as well. So Missouri's take on it, which every state has their own take on it. If, if it's in their state, if they're, they're, they all have their different models. Um, some states choose not to do anything about it and, um, because they may not have found very many um, samples of it in their state. Um, but Missouri's take on it is um, if they find a sample, uh, a positive sample of chronic wasting disease in the wild, they go to that area, they set up um, a perimeter, I believe, five miles around it and around where that was found, and they seek permission from landowners um, to eradicate deer. And by doing so, they're, they're trying to kill as many deer as they possibly can in that area, which I know it does sound bad, but you got to think big picture here. They don't want it to spread. So they're creating a radius around this area, eradicating the deer, sampling those deer, every single one of them they've killed, see if they've come up with more positive um, samples. And in most, not most cases, but some cases, if they haven't, they feel like they've caught it early enough to where it can't spread, um, and they remove all the carcasses. And um, that's that's something else that people need to be aware of as well as proper carcass disposal, um, especially if there's CWD in that area, because it if you don't properly dispose of the the carcass, it can spread um, from the soil to other deer. Right. Um, it's treated typically through saliva. So, you know, like if a deer died that had CWD and its bones and flesh went in the soil and another, another deer comes along and just happens to lick that area, he could potentially have chronic wasting disease. And then, you know, he goes and drinks out of this puddle over in another area and other deer drink out of that puddle and, you know, they pick up his saliva and they, they could potentially have it as well. So it can, it can spread very aggressively and it's a serious disease that I think people need to kind of be educated on and look into. And um, I know that Nobody wants the conservation department to come in and eradicate all the deer in there. I completely understand that. If, if it were in, my, if it were on our farm and they were like, "We're going to come in and eradicate all the deer," you know, I don't, I don't want that to happen. That that's going to really suck pretty bad. But I also don't want it to be spread throughout the entire state, and then you know, all the deer end up dying from it. So it's it's something that I think everyone needs to look into and just learn more about you yeah. know, what their state's doing to prevent. Absolutely, man. You know, a couple of things that I would say um, in response to what you just said is um, we feel your pain with the rifle season down here in Texas. We have, uh, yeah. you know, it starts uh, first weekend in November, and next year uh, across the state we'll go three weeks into January. So we cover all phases of the rut. <laughs> um, We've got we you know we have to deal with that too and it's uh and I mean not not to say that I haven't shot a few deer with a rifle either uh, but yeah it's definitely um, it's definitely lengthy here in Texas um, and you also make a good point about you know voicing your opinion we've got uh, a lot of pending leg- legislation changes or regulation changes here in Texas uh, I think actually uh, they closed the uh, public comment today. Um, which by the time this podcast ep- uh, episode airs will be uh, in the past. But, um, you know, we we didn't see any regulation regarding CWD, no mention of it. And so we're kind of working on that here uh, since we've had a few cases pop up here in Texas. So, um, I mean, it, it is, it's, uh, you, may, you, know, you made all the good points about it. Uh, it's, and it's something, you know, CWD, uh, prions or prions, however you want to say it, uh, can, can stay, um, you know, stay in the, in habitat, in, in the soil, in the grass for, uh, a long time, they say. So it's a scary thing. Yeah. I think the, the, you're exactly right. The, one of the scariest things about it is they don't know enough about it to basically get rid of it as far, you know, that as far as there's no, there's no cure for it. There's no, 
um, vaccination or something like that for these deer or anything like that. So, you know, everybody's trying these different methods and, you know, I think the worst thing you can do is nothing, do nothing about it. If, um, and ignore it. That's, that's the worst thing I think you can do about it. But edu- yeah. educate yourself as much as you can on, on what information's out there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great way to kind of wrap this thing up. Uh, I've got, uh, one statement, or I guess they're both questions. I've got a, I've got two questions left. One is, can y'all come walk around in the woods with me when I buy a property? <laughs> and the other is, uh, what's the best way to find out what Heartland Bowhunter and Sean Luchtel are up to these days? Um. Well, one, well, if you buy it in Missouri, I might be able to. <laughs> Especially in Northern Missouri. I, I mean, I love looking at, at land around here. It's, it's fun to look at, but... um. Mm-hmm. Probably not in Texas. I, I don't know if I'll get down there for that. <laughs> That's, <but. laughs> all right. That's all right. <laughs> if you want to look for more about what we're doing, we're, we're constantly doing, look us up on social media. Um, uh, Instagram or Facebook, we've got both of those, or Twitter. Um, and our handle on Instagram is Heartland Bow Hunter, all one word. Um, you can find our Facebook page, Heartland Bow Hunter, as well. And then um, I think my Instagram, I'm not very active on Facebook, so don't look for me on there. Um, but, or I guess you can, but you probably won't see much. But um, on Instagram, I, I try to stay more active there, and my handle on that is uh, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, um, underscore Wachtel, L-U-C-H-T-E-L. So you can find me find me on Instagram for what I've been up to and follow uh, Heartland Bowhunter on all of our social media channels and uh, watch our TV show on the Outdoor Channel, most importantly. Mm-hmm. Um our new season, season 11 will be coming up here in uh, July. Um, other than that, we've got content on Carbon TV. We've got full strut uh, turkey stuff on there. And then Behind the Draw, which is some uh, another mini series of extra content that we have um, also. So. That's appreciate awesome. Appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, man. I appreciate you coming on and, and uh, imparting some of the knowledge that you've learned. So, uh I guess uh, good luck in this in this off season, and uh, I look forward to seeing the new season. Thanks a lot. All right, we'll see you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, see you guys. Well, I'll tell you what's burning within me more than burning property is buying a property because you can't burn a property if you don't have permission to or own the property. And man, I just want a property so bad. Yeah, I went looking today. What'd you find? A bunch of high dollar <laughs> properties that are way too big. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. no, I just, I don't know. I, I would love to have a piece to, uh, to manage for sure. I mean, and having something like a round home, man, like mm-hmm. just to squeak out there in 10 or 15 minutes in, in the evening and just see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Not even during the season, you know, just looking around, whatever, just, and just to kind of be able to have something in your back pocket if you get an hour or two to go out there and, you know, make it a better piece of property for wildlife, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's something that I I'm, I just kind of got this itching to do lately. And uh, it'll probably be a while before anything happens, you know. Yeah. But uh, the good thing is I've got uh, I've got this podcast to refer to when I get to that point, you mm-hmm. know. And lots of good tips there. So Yeah. Well, on my, my rental property here, my uh, – what do they call the people who – my uh, – Landlord, landlord, yeah, landlord. my landlord. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, totally cool with me uh, shooting deer off the place. I got three acres here, and none of it's wooded. But uh, my plan is, I'm gonna institute a little bit of Sean stuff back there. I'm gonna burn off about a half acre on the back back here. Plant a uh, three sided. Uh, well, I guess it's not a polygon, like a square without one side, right? Triangle. Yeah. And no, <laughs> no, not triangle. Uh, it's going to be open on one side, but okay. plant like the perimeter in Egyptian wheat. Okay. To where it's like a, a visual shield. And mm-hmm. on the inside there, I'm going to plant some sort of like green. I don't know if it's going to be like peas or something like that or what, but something to get the deer going in there. And I think it's going to work. So and, you're. Your one side that you're leaving open is facing here? Facing the woods. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Didn't know so if you were going to try to peek into it. the property behind me, I'm straight up going to draw the deer off of this other property onto my place. But that's uh, welcome to free market enterprise, yeah. everyone. You know, like it's a part of the game. And uh, 
I ain't trying to shoot, you know, a giant trophy buck if one comes in, of course. But uh, I think it'd just be awesome to shoot a doe right here yeah. in my backyard. It'd be so cool. So sure, I hope man. to do that this year. Well, <clears throat> good luck, man. Thanks. Yeah, if you need any any supervision, let me know. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're going to actually burn it, though. Yeah. It's yeah. cool. Have you been out there in the back yet? Y'all don't think you have. I mean, we yeah, we did some stuff out there. Did we? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some okay, so some of it's like, I mean, it's not, it's hard to say. When it grows up in the summer, I think it gets to be like knee-high Bermuda mixed <clears throat> with some berry vines and junk, which none of that is very good mm-hmm. for deer food, right? Like the berry, like the leaves and the blackberries themselves are, but the vines, they're not going to eat the vine, you mm-hmm. know? So I think if I go out there and burn it and till it uh, for that half acre, might be doing something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that'll be interesting to see. We'll have to, uh, maybe we can like uh, put something on the website that's like the progress of the plot and then like throughout the fall, like trail camera photos from it and That'd stuff be cool. and like show like just show the process. You yeah. Know? I also had hogs like literally root underneath my back porch last night. I saw that, dude. Yeah, it's on the Instagram story. You sure they weren't mice? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> a little bigger yeah. but not much i don't know dude yeah. <laughs> some big old poops around here <laughs> yeah well uh i guess that about does it for us if uh if you guys have not yet there's a travel podcast that we did and it's a part one and two um make sure that you've listened to part one before too but that was one of the funnest things we've done was doing that podcast and just dreaming of all the spots sean had to talk yeah. about and then you know we posted uh I don't know. It felt like 50 or 60 pictures, but I don't know. I don't think it was that many, but I kind of had the whole like throwback, you know, of all these places KC and I had been and then some with Sean in there. That was a good time. So make sure if uh, if you're a dreamer or a uh, traveler, or, uh, if you just like cool stories, go listen to that thing. Uh, we put a lot of work into that and that was fun. So anyway, uh, other than that, man, we will uh, we'll catch y'all soon. We got another one, another good one lined up for you next week. So uh, check in on that, and remember, this is your element. Living it. Well, I wish the best.